A few of you have suggested in the comments that I should collaborate with Not Just Bikes, a channel run by a Canadian living in Amsterdam. I'm not sure what we would collab about, seeing as he's interested in Dutch urban planning while I live in rural Germany and focus more broadly on culture, history and life in general. But life in general does include how towns and cities are planned and built, so I can certainly talk about that. And the nearest city to me is, of course, Aschaffenburg. It's not big, with a population of 70,000 it counts as a medium city, but it is just about big enough to make a video like this a reasonable proposition. Let's start with a general overview. The most important design feature, which is difficult to see on this map, is the ring road. The idea is that through traffic is directed around the ring and so stays out of the city centre. And on some sections, that's a lot of traffic. The ring road took a couple of decades to complete, the oldest sections built at a time when the car-friendly city was the way of the future, leading to complicated eyesores that are a barrier to cyclists and pedestrians. I don't think that simply installing a flashing light to warn drivers not to run over pedestrians is any kind of sensible alternative to an actual pedestrian crossing. Newer sections are more modest, and this part was built alongside a convenient railway line in a cutting that helps keep the noise down considerably. And here the cutting was, as it were, roofed over to form a short tunnel allowing the city to reconnect two parks that had been separated by the railway. It's part of a kind of green belt running east to west through the city. At least, that's what this sign claims, but it seems to me like cheating because it includes this. And even more bizarrely, this. I mean, come on, that is a stretch. The northern part of the ring used to be a little further north. The problem was that it went through areas like this. If you build a road for through traffic, you want to build it with limited access to keep it away from local traffic and pedestrians. This kind of thing is not ideal. Not only is this area unpleasant to live in, it's also unpleasant to drive through with all those traffic lights. This section is now no longer officially part of the ring road. It's been replaced by this section. But whether this is really an improvement, I can't say. The old route is still important for some through traffic, and the new route still has its bits of unpleasantness. It also required the construction of this weird double roundabout thing. Roundabouts have, in general, a lot of advantages, but here, if you want to follow the ring road, the route you have to take is unnervingly complex. But does the ring road work? Well, there are plenty of pedestrian-friendly areas in the centre of Aschaffenburg, so that's a good thing. And every car going around the ring road is a car that isn't having to go through some residential or shopping district. But there is still a lot of traffic around, such as on this road, which, for some reason, is still classified as a federal route. In theory, this shouldn't make much difference, but federal routes are supposed to be designed for long-distance traffic, which the ring road is now supposed to carry. Back when car-friendly design was modern, it was thought a good idea to carefully segregate pedestrians and keep them away from the traffic. The way they did this was to build foot tunnels. On paper, this was the obvious solution, but the reality was these dark, forbidding passageways that can't be used by anyone with mobility issues. And here is another busy road that cuts through between the main shopping district and the part of town that includes the city hall and a big theatre. Part of it does go through a tunnel to create a big marketplace and a little park. Still, though, we have a road carrying through traffic, through the city centre, and spitting it out here. The tunnel is a good thing, don't get me wrong, but that it is necessary is a legacy of the car-centric design of the 1960s. These days, of course, this is considered to have been a mistake, and now Schaffenburg is, half-heartedly, trying to put things right. 
It's proving to be an uphill struggle though. This very short section of road, for example, was recently closed to all motor vehicles except buses and taxis. Not everyone seems to have got the message though. My guess is that a lot of these drivers don't intend to break the law, but their navigation systems haven't been updated. Still, they should really be paying attention to the signs. Here is a recently pedestrianised section of street, and here are some cars driving on it anyway. Incidentally, some of the other streets in the area are traffic calmed, colloquially but inaccurately known as play streets. Here, all road users, including pedestrians and cyclists, have equal priority. That's great, although when you allow this much parking, I'm not sure it's really an inviting place for cyclists. Now, I was filming here on two different days, and on the second of those days, this is what it looked like. I'm standing incidentally on the pedestrian street, where no motor vehicles are allowed at all and pedestrians have priority over cyclists. Even so, I had a car behind me that I didn't notice until this happened. In the rather angry conversation that followed, the driver claimed he was allowed to drive there. In retrospect, it's possible he was directed that way by police, although I didn't see any police directing any traffic. The reason it might be possible, though, is that there had been an accident. Shortly before I arrived, a car on this roundabout hit a bus and then crossed the road and crashed into a building. For legal reasons, I didn't film the scene of the accident while the emergency services were still attending to it. This is a press photo, and thankfully nobody was badly injured. But the road was closed for a couple of hours, and here's a map of where that happened. I'll mark the pedestrian street, and also this street is completely closed due to construction work, and these are all the one-way streets. With that road closed, traffic coming from here was cutting through the traffic calmed streets here, perfectly legally, but very inconveniently. Any traffic coming in the opposite direction was suddenly finding itself unable to go anywhere, and so drove, as far as I can judge illegally, on the pedestrianised street. So if you were on Frosinstrasse on that day and you saw me shouting at cars, I apologise, but what set me off was this, where no cars are supposed to be. I also had a conversation with a cyclist, and in retrospect I wish I'd asked him if he'd like to repeat it on camera. But like me, he was frustrated with the amount of traffic in Aschaffenburg, and his analysis was similar to what I had already begun to suspect. Massive great parking facilities in the city centre, and not enough buses. Now, as far as it goes, public transport in Aschaffenburg is adequate. Not great, but adequate. There's a nice new bus station next to the railway station, although when they built it they decided that coaches shouldn't be allowed to stop there. That's why if you come to Aschaffenburg by coach, it dumps you opposite a shopping centre a couple of blocks away from the station. One measure of car-centric design suggested by Not Just Bikes is to ask the question, how often do buses get stuck in traffic? Oh boy. Well, here's a bus lane that comes to a sudden end here, only to reappear after the junction. Why? Because cars have to be allowed to turn right so that they can park. Bad planning isn't always the culprit here. This car is illegally parked in the bus lane, and this happens a lot. I cannot tell you how many times my bus has been unable to use this bus lane. There is a lot of what appears to me, at least, to be illegal parking in Aschaffenburg, but I can't remember ever seeing any traffic police. Oh, and here's a car illegally driving onto a pedestrian street. There's no point in having regulations if they are not enforced. But back to my cyclist friend's point. There needs to be more parking outside of town with attractive public transport links. Well, there is one out-of-town park-and-ride facility, and this is it. Why is it so empty? because nobody in their right mind would want to use it.
To be sure, there is a good bus service that runs every 15 minutes, but this place is on the wrong side of town. This is OK if you're driving in from Darmstadt, but if you're coming from, say, the Autobahn, like most people would, it's quite ridiculous. Approach this place from the city centre or from the east or, well, from almost anywhere else except Darmstadt, and this is where you have to turn off. Do you see it? It's where this white car is going. This is the only entrance and exit, by the way. When you leave, you can only realistically do so towards Darmstadt. Oh, and this sign says it's free, but here's a barrier and a sign telling you that a season ticket costs 30 euros, presumably for one month, but it doesn't say, and go to the website for more information. Now, who is going to park their car here when they can just drive all the way into town and park next to the shops? As for cycling, there are these things dotted about the city, counting the number of bikes that pass. They show the daily and annual totals. Now, keep in mind that I filmed this in mid-September, and I think we can all agree that this is not what the council was hoping for. But then even I can see that the cycling infrastructure just isn't there. Here's part of the old ring road I mentioned earlier. Great, an entire lane given over to cyclists now that the ring road traffic isn't using it. But is that the same here? What's this painted on? Oh. My favourite example of misguided bike lane design is this bit, which sends cyclists straight into a line of parked cars. Not that I'm expecting the kind of bike infrastructure you can find in Amsterdam, but is it any wonder that these bike racks are empty? But don't get the wrong idea here. I like a Schaffenburg, and actually getting around without a car is OK. Not fantastic, but tolerably good. Here's an interesting idea so that we can finish off on a positive note. This street has a 20 km an hour speed limit, and this means that although cars technically have priority, they are expected to let pedestrians cross. And somehow it works, giving people direct access from the railway station's main exit straight to the shops. So, to all those who've told me in comments on previous videos that the government needs to sort this out, yeah, I absolutely agree. But I would also point out that the reason the government isn't sorting it out effectively is that people insist on driving. And as long as we keep doing that, we continue to give urban planners an incentive to prioritise the needs of the car and to neglect everything else.